question one. Work out 5.92 divided by 0 0.16. We can think of a division as a fraction. So I can write 5.92 over 0 0.16. And just like a fraction, as long as you do the same to the top and the bottom, a division will stay the same. So if I times top and bottom by 100, I can get rid of these decimals and have 592 divided by 16. Then I can either use long division, so have 16 and 592, and see how many times 16 goes into 592. Or I could simplify this further and half the top, half the bottom, so it's over 8, and the numbers will be a bit nicer. I'll just carry on with the 16. So I'll write down the 16 times table. So 16, 32, 48, 64, 80, 96, and then 4 to 100, and another 12. So 112, 128, 2 to 130, and then another 14. So 144 then 160, and that would be 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, lots of 16. So 16 doesn't go into 5, so that's 0, carry the 5 over, 16 goes into 59 3 times, which is 48, so I've got 11 left over, and 16 goes into 112, so 5, 6, 7 times. So our answer is 37. Write 324 as a product of powers of its prime factors. So we're going to break down 324 until we've just got prime numbers left. So we'll start with 324. I know it's in the 2 times table, and 2 is a prime number. Half of 320 is 160. Half of 4 is 2. So we've got 162. Again, in the 2 times table. And half of 162 is 81. 81 is 3 to the power of 4. So it's 3 times 27. 27 is 3 nines, And 9 is 3 threes. So we've just got prime numbers left. So as a product of its prime factors, so forget if we forget this powers to start with, as a product of its prime factors, I can write 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. But we need to write it as powers. So it's 2 squared times 3 to the power of 4. That is our answer. Question three, work out two and two thirds plus one and three fifths. Give your answer as a mixed number. So let's make these into top heavy fractions, improper fractions first. If we've got two whole ones and they're in thirds, so two times three is six. So two is six thirds plus another two thirds makes eight thirds. I've got one whole one and three fifths. So a whole one is going to be five fifths plus three more, which would be eight fifths. So I've got eight thirds plus eight fifths. To add fractions or to take fractions away, we need the denominators to be the same thing, the same number. So if I times my first fraction, top and bottom, by five, and my second one by 3, I can make both denominators 15. So 8 thirds is the same as 40 over 15, and 8 fifths is the same as 24 over 15. So now they're both out of 15, I can just add them together. So we're adding 15 ths. So the denominator stays the same, they're both 15 ths. 40 of them plus 24 of them, 
makes 64 of them. We need to give our answer as a mixed number. So how many whole ones do we have? We've got four whole ones. That's 60. Four times 15 is 60. And we've got four more. So we've got four and four fifteenths. Work out two thirds divided by three quarters. Dividing by three quarters is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of three quarters, which is four thirds. So I'm going to change it to a times and I'm going to flip over the second fraction. So it's the same. Two thirds divided by three quarters is the same as two thirds times four thirds. So if you change a divide to a times, you flip over the second fraction. Do the reciprocal, flip over the second fraction. So now we can just times the top, times the bottom. So to times fractions, to multiply fractions, times the top, times the bottom, two fours are eight, three threes are nine. The answer is eight ninths. Question four, work out the value of five to the power of negative three times five to the power of seven over five. When we multiply indices, we add the powers. So for the top, we've got negative three plus seven. Negative three plus seven is four. So it's five to the power of four divided by five. And if we just have five, we can think of that as five to the power of one. When we divide indices, we take away the powers. Four take away one is three. So we've got five cubed. And five cubed means five times five times five. And that is 125. Question five. Tracy writes down three numbers, A, B, and C. The ratio of A to B is three to five. A to C is four to seven. What's the ratio A to B to C? So both of these ratios have got an A in them. So to make them one ratio, we're going, we're going to need the A to be the same. The A has to be the same number. We've got a three and a four at the moment. If I want them to be the same, I'm just going to times the top ratio by four, the bottom one by three, and then they can both be 12. So A to B is three to five. But if I times it by four, it's still going to be in the same ratio. So it's 12 to 20. A to C is four to seven. But as long as I times both sides by the same number, the ratio stays the same. So it's also 12 to 21. So now A is the same. So I can make it into one ratio, A to B to C. So 12 to 20 to 21. Jamie writes down three numbers, D, E, and F. Find the ratio of E to D to F. For this one, the easiest thing to do is just to give them numbers. So if I say, I want to give E a number and I can give it one. So I can say, if E is one, what is D? So D is two E's, two times one is two. And if D is two, F is equal to three times two, which is six. And now I can just write these three numbers as a ratio. E to D to F, 1 to 2 to 6. If I'd started with a different number, if I'd given E, let's say I started with E as 2. D would have been worth two E's. So D would be 4, and F would be 3 D's. F would be 12. So the ratio would be 2 to 4 to 12 which is, of course, just the same, but doubled. So you could simplify it and get back to exactly the same answer.
but that would also be an answer. It didn't say we have to give it in a simplest form. So any equivalent ratio would be okay. Question six, the diagram shows a cuboid. The cuboid has height of three meters. The volume is 21 meters cubed. The pressure on the floor is 25 newtons per meter squared. Work out the force. So we've been given pressure equals force over area. We're going to use it to find the force. So to find the force, we need to know the pressure, which we've got. We've got the pressure, but we also need to know the area, which we don't have, but we can work out. So the area of the base of the cuboid, so this part here, the part that touches the ground, is going to be the volume divided by the height. Because the volume of a prism, the volume of this cuboid, is the area of the base times the height. So volume equals area times height. We know the volume is 21. We want to know the area, and the height is 3. So 3 times what number is 21? The area must be 7 meters squared. So now we know the area, we know the pressure, we need to work out the force. So the pressure is 25, and that's equal to force divided by area, which is 7. To get rid of a division, the opposite of division is multiplication. So to get rid of this divide by 7, we times by 7. So 25 times 7 is the force. And 7 lots of 25 will be 175. And the answer is in Newtons. Question 7. In a bag, there are counters. The counters are all either red or blue or yellow. The number of red counters to the number of blue counters to the number of yellow counters is 4 to 5 to 8. The number of yellow counters is 24 more than the blue counters. Work out the total number of counters. So we've got four parts red, five parts blue, and eight parts yellow. So yellow is 24 more than blue. And it's three parts. So it's eight parts yellow, five parts blue. So it's three parts more. And those three parts are worth 24 counters. So three parts are worth 24 counters, which means each one part is 24 divided by three, which is eight counters. So it's four lots of eight, five lots of eight, and eight lots of eight. So what's the total? So four lots of eight, five lots of eight, and eight lots of eight. So it's 104 plus 32, which is 136. ABC is a triangle, AEC and ADB are straight lines, AED is parallel to CB, that's what these arrows here mean, parallel lines, CED is 122 degrees, ABC is 59 degrees, work out angle CAB, that's this one up here. You must give a reason for each stage of your working. So there are going to be marks for the reasons here. So let's have angles in a straight line at up to 180 degrees. So we must have a 58 degree angle here. 180 take away 122 is 58 degrees. So we must give a reason. And the reason is 
angles on a straight line. And I'll write add to 180 degrees. We've got parallel lines here. So these two angles, we've got a line going through the parallel lines. And it's going to make the same angle both times. And when it's exactly the same angle on the other parallel line, it's called a corresponding angle. So when we've got two parallel lines and a line going through them, it makes the same angles. So this angle here and this angle here, exactly the same one, they're corresponding angles. This angle and this angle are corresponding angles. So it's exactly the same angle. This one and this one and this one and this one exactly the same angle on the other parallel line they're called corresponding angles so a d e is 59 degrees corresponding angles and i'll write also r equal so now we know two angles in this triangle up here angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees And we've got 59 and 58. So the other one must be 63. If they were all equal, it'd be 60, 60, 60. So it's two less than 60. Another one, so three less than 60. This one must be three more than 60. So CAB equals 63 degrees. Question nine. Roy spins a bias five-sided spinner 48 times. Here are his results. Roy is now going to spin the spinner another two times. Work out an estimate for the probability he gets a five both times. So we need to estimate the probability of getting a five. So he's got 16 fives out of 48 spins. 16 out of 48. Or half top and bottom, half again, and divide by four. So it's one third. So when he's been spinning the spinner, he's got a five one third of the times. And we're going to estimate that he's going to continue to get a five one third of the times. So an estimate he gets a five two times, both times. So the probability the first time is a third. The probability the second time is a third. So the chance of getting a, a five and then a five again is a third times a third, which is one ninth. Question 10. Solve the simultaneous equations. If we make either the x's the same or the y's the same, then we can eliminate them from the equation. So if I, I could double the top line and have a negative 2y and a positive 2y, then I could add the two equations together to get rid of the y's. Or I could times the top one by 5, the bottom one by 2, and have a 10x in both equations. And I could take away one equation from the other to eliminate the x's. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to times every term in the top one by 5. So 10x minus 5y equals 20. Every term in the bottom equation times 2 gives me 10x plus 4y equals 14. I'm now going to take away... I'll do the top equation, take away the bottom equation. 10x's, take away 10x's is nothing. Negative 5y, take away 4y, is negative 9y. And 20 take away 14 is 6. Divide both sides by negative 9. y is negative 2 thirds. Then I'm going to substitute that back in. 
So I'm going to substitute negative two thirds back in for y. So in my top equation, I've got two x minus minus two thirds equals four. When we have a minus minus, we add. So two x plus two thirds equals four. I'm going to half. I'm going to half every term. I think that'd be easiest. So I have x plus one third equals two. Take away one third from both sides. Two is six thirds. Take away one third is five thirds. So x is five thirds. And you can check that on the second equation to make sure it works. It definitely will. So it's five lots of five thirds plus two lots of minus two thirds should equal seven. So that's 25 thirds take away four thirds. 25 take away four is 21. 21 over three is seven. So it is definitely right. Question 11. Work out the value of eight to the power of four thirds plus one third to the power of negative three. So we've got eight to the power of four over three. The bottom number is the root. So we've got a three there. So it's a cube root. That's so cube root, the eight, and the top one just means a normal power. So then we're gonna do it to the power of four. So cube root the eight, gives a 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 is equal to 8. So 2 cubed is 8, so the cube root of 8 is 2. So we're going to do 2 to the power of 4. So that means 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, and that is 16. So this first number here is 16. What about the 1 third to the power of negative 3? So the negative in the power means we flip it over, the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of a third, a third flipped over, is 3 over 1, or just 3. So we've got 3 cubed, and that means 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. So this question says 16 plus 27 which will be 43. Question 12. There are P counters in a bag. 60 are white. Jill takes at random 50 counters from the bag. Eight of the 50 are white. Work out an estimate for the value of P. So eight out of 50. We're going to assume that eight out of every 50 in the bag are going, are going to be white, and we know there are 60 whites in total. So what do we have to multiply 8 by to get to 60? And 60 over 8, which is 30 over 4, which is 15 over 2, which is 7 and a half. So we have to times by 7.5. So we're going to times 50 by 7.5. So we're going to be saying there's seven and a half times as many. So 50 times 7.5 is 50 times 7, which is 350. Plus 50 times a half. Half of 50 is 25. So 350 plus 25 is 375. So we're going to say that P, our estimate for P, is 375. Question 13. So we've got a cumulative frequency table. And we need to draw a cumulative frequency graph. So with cumulative frequency, we're adding up as we go. 
we're always using the top point. So it's the height of tomato plants. So there are seven that are up to 150 centimeters tall. So 150 against seven. From 140 all the way, so including the first seven, up to 160, there are 17. So it's 160, 17. Up to 170 is 32. So 170, 32. Up to 180, so all the plants up to 180 centimeters tall, that's 51 plants. All of the plants up to 190 centimeters tall, that's 57 plants. And all of the plants up to 200 centimeters, which is all of the plants in total, there are 60 plants. So 60, 200. With these, we could use a smooth curve. So you could draw this freehand uh, to join them up. I'm not going to. I'm going to use a, a ruler just because it's quite difficult to draw on the computer. So we can do either. I'm going to use a ruler. And the question says, use the graph to find an estimate for the median height. So the median is the middle number. If there are 60 plants, we're looking halfway. So at 30, so we go to 30, we go along to our line, and then we go down and we read off whatever number we get. And I think I'm gonna say that's 160, 168 or 169. I'm going to go with 169, 169 centimeters. There'll be a range of acceptable answers for that one. So there won't be just one number that you have to get. As long as it's in the right area, you will get the mark. Question 14. X is inversely proportional to Y. Complete the table of values. So whenever we have an inversely proportional relationship, when one goes up, the other one goes down. It's the relationship X equals something divided by Y. And this something, this K, is just a number which we can work out. We can work out that number, and then we'll have a nice formula that we could use. And we've been given 80 and 2. So when X is 80, Y is 2. So 80 is something divided by 2. Double both sides. So the something must be 160. So our formula is x is equal to 160 divided by y. And you might want to make this even simpler by timesing by y. So x times y is always 160. So these two numbers always multiply to make 160. So 80 times 2 is 160, 16 times 10, 32 times 5, and 4 40s. So each of these sets of numbers fits with this equation. Question 15, the straight line L has equation 2y plus 3x minus 9 equals 0. Find an equation of the straight line perpendicular to L that passes through 3, negative 7. So if two lines are perpendicular, that means they meet at a 90 degree angle. And if we know the gradient of the first line, which we can work out, the gradient of the second line will be the negative reciprocal, flip and minus, of the first line. So our first line is 2y plus 3x minus 9 equals 0. I need it in the form y equals mx plus c, so I can tell what the gradient is. So I'm going to take away 3x from both sides and add 9 to both sides to get 2y by itself. 
I need it to be y equals. So I'm going to half every term. And it is now in the form y equals mx plus c. So m is negative 3 over 2. And the y-intercept, which we don't want to know, but it's 9 over 2. So that's the gradient of our original line. The gradient of the perpendicular line is a negative reciprocal of this. So the reciprocal means flip over. So 3 over 2 becomes 2 thirds. And if it's the negative reciprocal, it would be negative, negative, which means positive. So if one line's negative, the other one's positive. And you can see that by just drawing them, you'll see if one goes up, the other one goes down. And that will always be the case with perpendicular lines. One will be positive, the other one will be negative. So the gradient of our perpendicular line is two thirds. So it's going to be in the form y equals mx plus c. But to find the, the equation, we also need to know what c is. And we can use these coordinates to do it. So when x is 3, y is negative 7. So I can change y into negative 7 and x into 3. So negative 7 equals 2 thirds of 3. 2 thirds of 3 is 2. To get c by itself, take away 2 from both sides. c is negative 9. So our equation is y equals 2 thirds x minus 9. The box plot shows the number of visitors to a park on each of 180 days. Work out an estimate for the number of days there were fewer than 350 visitors to the park. So we can see 350 is here. And that is the upper quartile. So with a box plot, we've got the lowest number. That's the lowest number of visitors. That will be the lower quartile. The median in the middle. And the highest number of visitors on the end. And each of these sections represents a quarter of the visitors, a quarter of the days. So if there's 180 days, so this will be the lowest one. The median will be the 90th one, halfway. The lower quartile will be the 45th. The upper quartile will be 3 45s, 135, and the highest will be the 180th day. So an estimate for the number of days fewer than 350. So it's three quarters are less than the upper quartile. So 135 days. So each of these quarters will be 45 days. So 45 days there, 45 days there, 45 there, and 45 days there. Prove that the difference between the squares of two consecutive odd numbers is a multiple of 8. So we want an odd number first, so an even number we can write as 2n. Because 2n is the 2 times table. So that's always an even number. An odd number is 1 more than the 2 times table. If I want the next odd number after 2n plus 1, I'm going to have 2 more than 2n plus 1. And that's 2n plus 3. Because the odd numbers go up in 2s. I want the difference between the squares of two consecutive odd numbers. So the squares mean square them, and the difference means take away. So I'm going to have 2n plus 3. I'm going to write them with the biggest one first. 2n plus 3 squared, take away 2n plus 1 squared. 
I'm going to write these as double brackets. So 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 3. Take away 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. Expand and simplify now. 2n times 2n is 4n squared. 2n times 3 is 6n. 3 times 2n is 6n. 3 threes and 9. Now this is where we have to be careful. We want to take away all of this. So I'm going to keep a bracket around it when I expand it. So I don't forget. I don't want to just take away the first term. It's take away all of 2n plus 3 squared. 2n plus 1 squared. Taking away the whole thing. So 2n times 2n is 4n squared. 2n times 1 is 2n. 1 times 2n is 2n. 1 times 1 is 1. And then I'm going to collect the like terms. So I've got 4n squared plus 12n plus 9. Take away 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. Now, because I'm taking away all of this, the whole second bracket, I'm going to have minus 4n squared minus 4n minus 1. So you can, you can think of this as expanding a bracket with a negative 1 on the outside. So I have 4n squared plus 12n plus 9 minus 4n squared minus 4n minus 1. And then again, collect the like terms. So I've got for n squared, so I've got 4n squared, take away 4n squared. So that's nothing. 12n take away 4n is 8n. And 9 take away 1 is 8. I need to prove it's a multiple of 8. And if I factorize out the 8, it's 8 times n plus 1. So it must be in the 8 times table because it's 8 times something. So therefore, it's a multiple of 8. Question 18. A and B is a point. A and B are points on the circumference of a circle, center O. AC is a tangent to the circle. OBC is a straight line. O to A is 5 centimeters. A to C is 12 centimeters. Find the length of B to C. So that's this part here. Where a tangent meets a radius, we know there's a 90 degree angle. So wherever a tangent meets a radius, it's a 90 degree angle. So we know we've got a right angle triangle here. And we can find the whole length of O to C using Pythagoras. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. 5 squared plus 12 squared equals O to C squared. So 25 plus 144 is O C squared. That's 169. The square root of 169 is 13. So the whole length is 13 centimeters. And we know the radius of the circle is 5 centimeters. So we can just say B to C is 13 take away 5 which is 8 centimetres. Question 19. A cone has height 12 centimetres, volume 72 pi centimetres cubed. Find the diameter of the cone, so not the radius, the diameter. Have to make sure we don't miss that one at the end. Give your answer in the form A root B, where A is an integer and B is prime. So this is just substituting into the formula. Volume is 72 pi. And that's equal to one third times pi. 
times the radius squared times the height, which is 12. And then we just need to simplify this. So divide both sides by pi, and the pi's will go. A third of 12 is 4. So 72 is 4 r squared. 72 divided by 4 is the same as 36 over 2, which is 18. So 18 equals r squared. So the radius is square root 18. Simplifying the third, so root 18 has got a, a 9 in it. That's a square number that's inside. So when we simplify a third, we're looking for a square number as a factor. So it's square root 9 times square root 2. Square root 18 is the same as square root 9 times square root 2. Square root 9 is 3. So we've got 3 root 2 as our radius. Radius is 3 root 2. The diameter is 2 radiuses. So it's 6 root 2. Question 20. A, B, and C are three points such that A to B is 6A plus 9B. A to C is 10A plus 15B. Prove that they're on a straight line. So to be on a straight line, if we've got A, B, and C, to be on a straight line, they must be going in the same direction. So A to B and A to C must be going in exactly the same direction. We can show that they're going in the same direction by showing that one is a multiple of the other one. So if I write A to B, if I factorize it, so it's 6A plus 9B, I can take 3 out. So it's 3 times 2A plus 3B for A to C. I've got 10A plus 15B. I can take 5 out, but it's 5 times 2A plus 3B. So they're both multiples of 2A plus 3B. So they're both going in the direction 2A plus 3B. So both are going in the direction, in the same direction. 2a plus 3b. Or I could say that a to c is 5 thirds of a to b. So if I times a to b by 5 over 3, I would get a to c. So I could say one is a multiple of the other. Either, either one of these two answers, so either both are going in the direction 2a plus 3b, or one is a multiple of the other. And of course, to be on a straight line, they don't just have to be going in the same direction. They also need to go through the same point, and they both go through a. So and both go through a. So if they're going in the same direction, and they're going through the same point, they must be on a straight line. Three points, D, E, and F are on a straight line. D to E is 4A minus 5B. E to F is negative 12A plus 15B. Find the ratio of the length of D to F the length of d to e so we don't have d to f so d to f to get from d to f we need to go d to e and then e to f so if we go d to e then e to f we go d to f so d to e is 4a minus 5b e to f is minus 12a plus 15b. So 4a's take away 12a's. 
is negative 8a's. Negative 5b plus 15b is 10b. So now we know what d to f is. And we can factorize. So let's take out 2. So it's 2 lots of minus 4a plus 5b. That's d to f. d to e is just 4a minus 5b. Now, negative 4a plus 5b and 4a minus 5b, they're going in the opposite directions. So if I had 4a minus 5b, let's say that was in this direction, and I've got two lots of minus 4a plus 5b, so it's twice as long, but in the opposite direction. We only want to know about the lengths. So I'm not going to write a negative in my ratio. We only care about the lengths. And the length of this line, the green one, is twice as long. So the length is twice as big. So the ratio, 2 to 1. Question 21. We've got functions f and g. We want to know... Well, f of x is 3x squared plus 1. We want to know what the inverse function of that is. So the opposite function, the thing that does the opposite to 3x squared plus 1. We could rearrange a formula here, or we could just look at what happens in this function and go backwards. So if we're putting a number in for x, what are we doing to it? So the first step would be square, squaring it. Then you'd times it by 3. Then you'd plus 1, and you'd get your output. We want to go backwards for the inverse function. So we're going to go in here. And what happens if I go backwards? So the opposite of plusing 1 means minus 1. The opposite of timesing by 3 is dividing by 3. The opposite of squaring is square rooting. And then that would be my output on the other side. So it is the inverse function is x take away 1 over 3 square rooted. So that is my inverse function. That is the opposite function. If I put a number in this one, say I put 2 in, I do 2 squared, which is 4, times 3, which is 12, plus 1 is 13. So then if I put 13 into this one, I should go back to 2. So 13 take away 1 is 12, over 3 is 4, square rooted is 2. So it's the opposite function. If you were rearranging the formula, you would write y equals 3x squared plus 1. And then take away 1. Divide by 3. And then square root. So that's 1 equals x. And that gets you the same answer. You just have to write that with an x in there. And f minus 1x equal. Solve g f of x equals 95. That means we're putting the f function into the g function. So the whole of the f function, so 3x squared plus 1, into g. So it's g of f of x, which is 3x squared plus 1, equals 95. So that means wherever we have an x in our g function, we change it into 3x squared plus 1. So that's 2 times 3x squared plus 1, take away 3, equals 95. Expand the brackets. So 6x squared plus 2, take away 3, 
equals 95. 6x squared minus 1 equals 95. Plus 1 to both sides. 6x squared equals 96. Divide both sides by 6. 96 over 6 is the same as 48 over 3, which is 16. So x squared is 16. x is square root 16, which is 4. And it can't be negative 4 because we have to put in something bigger than 0. Question 22. Write square root 8 over 3 minus root 2 in the form a root 2 plus b over c, where a, b, and c are integers. So we need to rationalize the denominator. And we're also going to be simplifying thirds at some point. I'll start just by rationalizing. So when we have 3 minus root something on the bottom, 3 minus root 2, to get rid of the thirds from the bottom, we need to times by 3 plus square root 2. So we're kind of using the difference of two squares to cancel out the square roots. So when there's a minus here, we do the same but a plus. If there was a plus here, we do the same but with a minus. And if I times the bottom by 3 plus root 2, to keep the fraction the same, I need to times the top by 3 plus root 2. So we're just expanding brackets now. On the top, I've got root 8 times 3. 3 root 8s. And I've got 8 root 8 times root 2, which is root 16. Or I could just write as 4. On the bottom, 3 3s are 9. 3 times root 2 is 3 root 2. Negative root 2 times 3 is negative 3 root 2. That's why we did a plus and a minus. So these are going to cancel out. A negative root 2 times a positive root 2 is minus 2. So we have 3 square root 8 plus 4 over 7 on the bottom. It's almost in the form we want it. But we can't have a root 8. It needs to be something root 2. Square root 8 can be simplified. It's got a 4 inside it. 4 is a square number. So root 4 times root 2, which is 2 root 2s. So we have 3 times 2 root 2, which is 6 root 2s. So 6 root 2 plus 4 over 7 is our answer. Question 23. Find the set of values of x for which 25 minus x squared is bigger than 0 and 3x squared minus 17x minus 6 is less than 0. You must show all your working. So let's start with 25 minus x squared. So let's think of this as the graph of y equals 25 minus x squared. I'm finding out where the graph is bigger than 0, where it's above the x-axis. So if I want to find out where it crosses the x-axis, I'm solving the equation 25 minus x squared equals 0. And it's a difference of two squares. It's 5 plus x times 5 minus x, so it crosses the x-axis at negative 5 and at 5. So it's a negative x squared graph that crosses at negative 5 and 5. So it's shaped like this, something like that. And we want to know where it's bigger than 0. So it's above the axis between negative 5 and 5. So the answer to just the first one is x is between negative 5 and 5. 
25 minus x squared is bigger than zero for any answer between negative five and five. For the second one, again, let's do the same thing. Let's think of this as a graph. And if I want to know where it's crossing the x-axis, I want to solve this equation. This time I want to, want to know where it's less than zero, where it's under the x-axis. And I want to factorize this. I'm going to do a times c, so 3 times negative 6, or 3 times 6 is 18. What multiplies to make 18? 118, 2 9s, or 3 6s. Which of those can give me a negative 17? It's going to be 1 and 18. So I'm going to rewrite it as 3x squared. I'm rewriting negative 17x as 1x take away 18x. And now I'm going to factorize it. I'm going to put it into brackets. So something, what comes out of these first two terms? So these first two terms here, if I factorize those, I can take x out of both of them. So I'm going to write x as my first term. x times something is 3x squared. That's 3x. For the second term, x times something is x. That's 1. My third term, something times 3x is negative 18x. That's negative 6. And negative 6 times 1 is negative 6. So it crosses the x-axis at 6 and minus a third. So this time I've got a positive x-squared graph crossing at minus a third and at 6. So it's shaped like this. So where is it less than 0? That's in between minus a third and six. So the question says, find a set of values for x, but when both of these are true, it's this and this. So where are they both true? Where is this one above the x-axis and this one below the x-axis? So we can't have minus five or minus four or minus three because this one doesn't count. So it's only from minus a third that they're both below. And I can't have anything past five because this one's gonna drop below. So five is my upper limit. So between minus a third and five, this one's bigger than zero and this one's less than zero. So that is the answer.